What's up everybody, this is Cakes, and in today's tutorial we're going to add in gravity, jumping, falling, moving and tile collision. In order to do this tutorial I've added in the sprite to the PNG file or the texture atlas. If you want to have this then you have to go to the link in the description which will get you to the repository and then in the repository you can go to assets, textures and then you can download the a sprite file if you're using a sprite or the PNG file if you use that. This sprite has actually a bounding box and you can see this at the bottom left right here of 17 by 20 pixels. The reason why this is is because later on we're going to animate this character and this is the bounding box of what it will look like or however many pixels we have to skip until the next animation frame. But we'll get into this later. Just notice that it is 17 by 20 because we are now going to add this into the game. So first we're going to add in the Sprite Celeste into our sprites and I'll put this below the dice. And then below the dice in the switch case, we're going to add Celeste. It is 112 pixels to the right, 0 pixels on top and 17 by 20 pixels. Now we can quickly go into the game and change our player sprite in the draw function. So over here where we draw the player, we use the sprite Celeste. Now if we run the game, we will have our lovely character already in the game and we can start adding to the player. There is a great article by Maddie Thorson, one of the developers of Celeste. And in this article, he's going over how there is solids and actors. Basically a solid is a wall. One of our tiles for example is a solid and an actor would be our character. And uh, solids will always move if they move. For example you remember the moving platforms from the very beginning. This would be a solid as well that can always move no matter what happens. And an actor whenever they move they move one pixel at a time. And every time they move one pixel they will check for collision again. And the reason for that is described in this article it makes it very simple and very easy to test collision against other characters or other obstacles and it is always pixel perfect. And on top of that the bounding boxes are aligned to the axis which means that we create a rectangle around our player and that is going to be it's not going to be rotated or anything else it is going to be axis aligned. Let's quickly go over the move x function here. The way this works is we have a float amount that we want to move each frame and the reason why we store this as floats is because we want to make sure that we are always correct and however much we move. If we have 0.5 pixels left over to move, we need to store that amount because then the next frame we might have enough to get to a full value. And so what we do here is we keep track of what I, what they call an X remainder. This is for the fractional part. And then they round this X remainder to however many pixels we need to move in this frame. And keep in mind that we're only moving in one direction right now, in X direction. And then while we move, we remove from the remainder however many pixels we have moved. Then we get the sign. Do we go to the left or do we go to the right? And then while this sign or while we still have to move, we will check for collision. If we don't collide, then we actually move the character. And then of course, we remove by one by the sign. If we are colliding with something, in our case, we will do nothing for now. Later on we will kill the character on certain impacts but for now we will just do nothing. And that is the basic idea on how we can move in X and Y direction. And this is where I would like to start and then outwards from this I'm going to implement all of the missing parts. So in our game.cpp file we want to go into the simulation loop and then where we update the player right after we set the previous position I'm going to paste in the move X function and this is going to be a bit much. But first and foremost we have to calculate or get a rectangle around the player. This is going to be our collision box. And so that is the first thing that I would like to implement right above this function actually. The player rectangle is going to be 4 pixels to the left and 4 pixels to the right. So basically 8 pixels in total. And then we have a generic 2 tile height. Basically 8 pixels to the top and then 16 pixels down again. So 8 pixels up and 8 pixels down. And you might have noticed that for that we need an iRect and I'm going to add this into the schnitzel lib in the math section. I want to put this below the matrix right at the very bottom. Seems like at the very bottom. And I pasted in a bunch of uh, things. I pasted in a rectangle, an integer rectangle, and then a bunch of helper functions that let us determine whether something is inside of a rectangle or whether we have rectangle to rectangle collision. I want to quickly go over this. We have a point in X coordinate and what we have to check is whether this point is greater or equal than the X position of the 
rectangle and if it is lesser or equal than the size the position plus the size of the rectangle and then we do the same thing for the y coordinate and then we know if a point is inside of these four points then we have a point inside of a rectangle and then for the rectangle collision this is a little bit more difficult but we have the comments here to help us out basically the first line says the left wall of a is less than the right wall of b so if we have two rectangles a and b then we're talking about this left wall right here this has to be somewhere in here basically it cannot be greater than this right wall of b it has to be here somewhere in this vicinity and then the next one is talking about the right wall of a and the left wall of b basically the right wall of a has to be greater than the left wall of b this wall right here to the right has to be at least here and somewhere in this vicinity so basically we are trying to overlap the left and right wall of a with b somewhere here it can be higher or lower but it's gonna be somewhere in here and then basically we repeat the same steps with top and bottom and so that means that we are somewhere inside of this rectangle and this is what these four lines do and then we switch back to the game we should be able to get the player rect now and then assign that in the local scope in the move x function next you see that we are storing some sort of remainder and the player's speed this is how much we want to move each frame in order to do that we have to switch to the game.h file and inside of the player structure I'm keeping track of a vector 2 of speed. Once you have this in here, switch back to the game.cpp file. At the very top where we update the player, I want to get a player reference to the player using the game state. And then we don't have to access the game state everywhere. We can just do player.position. Now, and this is what I do. And I like this more because the remainder is only something that the player will access. And so I'm creating a bunch of static variables here that will only be visible or accessible by the player so for example the static vector 2 remainder is something that we keep here on or inside this local scope because only the player needs access to this and so i don't want to get this outside and then you see down below we have to implement this sign function here and in order to do that we have to go into the schnitzel lib i want to put this below max and while i'm doing this i also want to add in some more other functions we will have the sign on x the sign on float we will have a maximum function for long longs we will have a maximum function for floats then we have a minimum function for floats and then we will have this approach function which will be interesting later but i'm already pasting this in here just so we don't have to switch later on essentially what is happening here is we have a current speed and we would like to go to a target speed based on a certain speed up and so whenever we are below that target we are going to increase and if we are above that target we are going to decrease so basically that will give us somewhat of a smooth transition to always be on the speed that we want to but if we have more speed then we are gradually going down if we have less speed then we are gradually going up and this is basically the approach function that they use in celeste so switching back to the game we can now see that we have almost everything that we need okay so in the move x function we get the player rectangle and then we store the remainder of the x of the player's speed so right now we are not changing it but we are storing the speed inside the remainder and then we basically do the same thing that we saw on the website we check out well how much do we have to move in x direction do we have to move yes we do have to move and then we just keep the fractional part in the remainder then we get the sign the move sign do we move left or right we store the collision happened boolean false and then over here i added in a lambda function that moves the player and then stops aka returns if we have a collision the reason why this is a lambda function is because in c the only way to break out of two for loops is to create some sort of weird boolean variable or to use go to and uh, this one is a little bit more clean so while we have to move an x inside of our move player x function which is right here we call this right here we add to the position of the player and notice that this is not actually the position of the player but this is the rectangle of the player so and then we check whether this rectangle will have collision or not and in order to do that we have to loop through the entire grid get the tiles check if they are visible and if they are visible get their rectangle and then check for rectangle collision and so now we can go into the specifics of what we have to do here the player has a position inside the world or inside the grid somewhere and in order to get that position the grid position an x and y coordinate we need a helper function that determines the grid position based on the player's 
position inside the world. That is the first thing that we have to do. So we go up above the simulate function and then below the get player rect function. Actually, since this is according to tiles, I would like to paste this above the get tile function by using get grid position. And then I would like to change the get tile here to give me a get grid position. So basically, instead of converting the world position to an xy position ourselves in the function, we just call the get grid position function and then we return get tile on x and y of that grid position which is the one right here so we just reference this right now that we have this at the very bottom you still see that we have to get a rectangle of a tile basically we have our tile position now we have to get a rectangle and we already know the position of the tile because we are calculating it down below in order to draw it right here we get this position we just have to extract this out into its own function and then create a rectangle around this so copy this right here and then go up above the simulate function below the get player rectangle function and then we add in two more functions one of the functions is the get tile position function which takes in coordinates and it's x and y and the resulting position is inside of our world then it's basically taking the grid and converting it into the world and then the get tile rect function basically takes the position of the tile and then creates an 8x8 bounding box around itself. Now if we scroll down we should be able to get the grid position of the player and the tile rectangle of the tile. And this is where I want to go into the double for loop here. You notice that this is relative to the player's grid position and not the entire tile grid. Now this is a little bit more efficient. You can also go through the entire grid and don't do this. Basically we take the grid position of the player and that is inside of our array somewhere and then we go one to the left and one to the right and then for y since we are two tiles big we are going to go a minus two to the top and two in the bottom direction so we're checking four tiles on y and three tiles on x so three times four is what we have to do here and then it's basically the same code we check whether we get a tile back if it's visible or if we actually have one then we get the rectangle of the tile and then we check for rectangle collision using the player rectangle and so we go through the entire loop and if we don't have any collision we'd never returned here then we actually move the player and remove from our move variable basically okay we have now just successfully moved one pixel and this is the entire function that you have to do in x and the same thing holds true for y so i'm going to quickly paste that in for y if we look at the move y function nothing really changes much we just index into the y coordinate the only difference is on collision detection we want to check whether we are falling or moving down and that is when our speed is positive you might have noticed that we have the zero zero point on the top left and then when we go down it goes positive and when we go up it goes negative so essentially when we are falling our speed will be positive and then when we have a collision we must have collided with a tile on top which means we are now grounded that will allow us to jump later and then obviously we set the speed to zero we want to cancel out any speed if that happens and then we move the player just like normal and then we call the move player y function and so this is also the reason why this is not extracted out into its own function because on collision we do something else but if you want to you can do some sort of callback what happens when you collide you might have noticed that we don't have a grounded boolean which means we have to add this as another static variable at the very top here that means that only this section has access to this okay now we actually want to move the player and in order to do that we have to get rid of this at the very bottom move left down right and up i would like to extract this out and i just noticed i accidentally put move i put everything into move x the move y is also part of move x let's extract this out and then put this below move x sorry about that now what do we want to do we would like to jump and move to the left and to the right i think moving left and right is the first one that is very simple to do and easy in order to do that we need some sort of const expressions in order to run we need to be able to know what is the maximum speed for now it's going to be two pixels per second then we need to know how many pixels per second we accelerate and then we need to know how many pixels per second we decelerate and then when we move left or move right we're going to change the player's speed based on these values and there's a little bit of explaining to do here on move left we approach the speed of the player to the minus run speed based on how much we accelerate each frame and then in the move right case we do the same thing but we use positive run speed now you might have noticed this multiplication here and the player speed change basically this is to avoid when you change directions that the player feels unresponsive so essentially what i'm doing here is if i'm trying to walk into the opposite direction i'm canceling out 
the current run acceleration or how much I'm running into the current direction by a multiplier and basically making it faster to turn around. Now this is not perfect. Maybe it's easier to just set the speed to zero and then uh, accelerate from that point onwards. Uh, you will have to test this out. This is just how I did it. And then you might have noticed that we need delta time. And uh, this is very simple to get in the simulation function. We just do float delta time, which is the update delay. And quickly, if we want to inspect this, this is one divided by our frames per second. So for right now, it is one divided by 60. So if we start the game right now, we will be able to move to the left and to the right. But we never stop. If we move in one direction, the player will accelerate in that direction and never stop. So in order to fix that, I want to add in some sort of friction. The friction basically happens whenever we don't move to the left and we don't move to the right and we are grounded. Then we check, well, by how much does the player get reduced over time? And then we also have to check whether we are flying or we are currently falling because we don't want to have the same control compared to when we are on ground so in order to do that we need another constant which is the fly reduce this fly reduce currently is basically half of the run reduce but again you have to play around with these values uh, this is actually something that takes a long time to make perfect uh, i'm just giving you some sort of guidance of how it could work now that we have the friction we will be able to accelerate and decelerate much faster okay now that we can move we also would like to have gravity so basically what we are doing is we are approaching the y speed of the player by a certain maximum fall speed using gravity and in order to do to do that yes you have guessed it we need two more constants at the very top i set the gravity to 13 and the fall speed to 3.6 but now if we run the game then the player will fall down <laughs> And he falls down so fast that we need some sort of handle to reset the player because I want him to land on the tiles. And this is where I'm going to yank one of the move up functions here, or the move up. And we set the player dot position to nothing. And that would be the top left. And then we get rid of move down, building. And now if we click the up button, the player should be spawning at the very top. And now we are able to move the player on top of these tiles and if we try to budge him in he should not be able to move past these so yeah that is the first part of collision and now we can actually add in jumping too because we have the grounded variable so we switch over back to the code and um, let's do this at the very top i guess in order to jump we check whether we have pressed the jump key and we are grounded if we did then we set our speed to the jump speed which basically makes our character move quite fast high and then down fall down fast for now, I've set the jump speed to minus three, but you might have noticed that this jump input is not something that we have actually initialized in the game as a key bind. So we need to go into the update game function at the bottom and then add this key bind here. For now, I'm just going to bind the space key. You can try out any other keys. You can even do the proper Celeste key bindings if you want to. I think it's C on the mouse. I've been using the controller, so I don't know, but I think it was C. And now we can jump as well as move around. And this is already enough to make a somewhat, well, I mean, decent looking platformer if we have some sort of loose condition. And this is everything for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe like always. It really does help a lot. And I'll see you all in the next one in which we create moving platforms that the player can interact with. Until then, have a good one. Peace.